Today, we will learn and reflect on how concubines were treated in the ancient world, particularly in the Iliad of Homer and the Torah in the Old Testament, with teachings and observations from Christian sources and history. Now, you may ask, how can we benefit when we ponder the concubines in the ancient world, who were often captured as booty in war, who often had no say in their fate? We should encounter the ancient world on its own terms and not quickly condemn the ancients by reading back our honored sensibilities into ancient cultures. Also, we can more accurately understand and interpret ancient Greek and Old Testament stories and history when we understand that ancient cultures were warrior cultures. As always, we want to learn to be more compassionate towards our fellow man when he is in difficult circumstances. So thankfully, being kidnapped by marauding soldiers is no longer a possibility that most modern women must face. At the end of our talk, we will discuss the sources used for this video and the blogs that uh, cover this topic. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Sometimes these generate short videos of their own. Let us learn and reflect together. Before attacking Troy, the Greeks first attacked and sacked the cities of their allies surrounding Troy, seeking both booty and beauties, carrying off many young maidens as concubines. King Agamemnon won the young girl Chryseis, while Achilles won the beauty Briseis. Now this may sound to our ears to be brutal, that these men without a twinge of conscience would kidnap young girls in the heat of battle, but yet when we let the poet of the Iliad sink in and we realize that Achilles really does truly love Briseis, and when she is taken away, he loses his heart for battle. Likewise, Agamemnon professes fondness for Chryseis, with maybe not as much uh, sincerity, but after all, his wife is far away in Greece, many fathoms and many years away. So, for the moment, Chryseis is preferable. Chryseis, the father of Chryseis, priest to Apollo, bravely visits the armed camp of the enemy, the camp of the Greeks, alone, unarmed, bringing a ransom for his beloved Chryseis. Chryseis is shown no hospitality, however, by King Agamemnon, but is discourteously told to leave from whence he came, which is initially what angered the gods. This breaking of hospitality is something you just do not do in ancient Greek culture. We have another video that delves into these brave camp meetings in the Iliad and also in another warrior culture, the American Indians, in a companion video, which we will link to at the end of this video. Chrysus has only one option. He prays to Apollo to compel the Greeks to ransom his daughter. Apollo, the god of medicine and the god of plague, shoots his holy arrows among the Greeks, first hitting dogs, then mules, then men, and infecting many in the camp with the plague. And we quote from the Iliad. For nine days the plague raged, and on the tenth day Achilles asked a seer to peer into the motive of the god Apollo, since Chrysus was a priest of Apollo. After an augury, the seer answered, The god is enraged because Agamemnon spurned his priest. He refused to free his daughter, and he refused the ransom. King Agamemnon is compelled in council to give up his prize, the young girl Chryseis, to her father Chrysus to stop the plague. But he does not surrender her nobly, but behaves badly like a spoiled child. King Agamemnon, selfishly with the great hubris, commands, fetch me another prize and straight off too, else I alone of the Argives go without my honor. This would be a disgrace. You are all witnesses. Look, my prize is snatched away. But what is at stake is not his prize, but his pride. He chides Achilles, I will take Briseis and all her beauty, your own prize. So you can learn just how much greater I am than you. And here Agamemnon is guilty of the main sin of the Iliad, hubris, which is the overweening arrogance and overconfidence that leads you to foolish decisions and impetuous decisions that anger the gods and upset the order of the, of the society. Uh, Achilles starts to draw a sword and slay the wayward monarch on the spot, but Athena intervenes and he slides his sword back into his sheath. Achilles instead lashes him with angry words in the Iliad. Staggering drunk with your dog's eyes, your fawn's heart. 
Never once did you arm the troops and go into battle or risk an ambush. Packed with Ikea's picked men, you lack the courage. You can see death coming. Safer by far, you find, to foray through the camp, commandeering the prize of any man who speaks against you. This king who devours his people, worthless husks, the men you rule. Now, Professor Elizabeth Van Diver, he, she's the professor that has this excellent s series of lectures on the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Great Courses. She opines that Agamemnon did much more than rob Achilles, his concubine, that in his hubris, uh, he stripped from Achilles not just his armor, but worse, he stripped from him his honor and his glory, making him lose face before his comrades. Indeed, gaining respect and avoiding shame is critical for warriors and men of any age. In our video, the warrior cultures of the Iliad and the American Indians, neither the Homeric hero nor the Indian brave can ever show any signs of romantic love to his fellow warriors, lest he lose respect and dignity. But there are clues that suggest that perhaps Perseus is not the typical concubine. She actually has a few lines of dialogue in the Iliad, and her later actions suggest she genuinely cares for Achilles, which is reciprocated by pieces of dialogue from Achilles himself. Achilles' goddess mother, Thetis, agrees to plead his case with Zeus, who arranges to let the tide of battle turn to favor the Trojans until they drive the Greeks to the sea and start burning the Greek ships. Now Achilles barely mentions Briseis in his telling of the story to his mother Thetis, but she and the other gods know what is in his heart. Achilles and his subjects, the Myrmidons, withdraw from the battle and encamp on the shore next to his ships. His best friend, Patroclus, sadly delivers Briseis to Lord Agamemnon. When the tide of war goes against the Greeks, Patroclus convinces Achilles to lend him his armor and shield so he can fight in his place, in his armor. The Greeks drive back the Trojans to the walls of Troy, where Patroclus is killed by Hector in battle. Briseis shows her devotion to Achilles after the rich Greeks return from the battlefield with the corpse of Achilles' best friend, Patroclus. Briseis and Achilles both mourn over the corpse of his best friend, Patroclus. In this next painting, Agamemnon has agreed to return Briseis to Achilles so he can return to battle. In this painting, the elderly Nestor returns the beauty Briseis to Achilles, along with horses and many other gifts. The man appointing above is either Odysseus or he's Agamemnon, swearing that he has not touched the beauty Briseis. Of course, it does not make sense for Agamemnon to claim this unless we suppose that Briseis risked her life refusing his advances, although the Iliad is totally quiet about this possibility. We see the masts of the Greek ships in the background, and to the right we see the corpse of his friend, the warrior Patroclus, in the small tent to the right. Now Achilles can return to battle and revenge his friend's death by killing his nemesis, the Trojan warrior Hector, and Zeus can release the curse on the Achaeans so they can sack Troy. So, in the beloved Iliad, many Greeks were sacrificed to uphold the glory and honor of Achilles. We want to mention that there's an interesting role reversal into the sequel to the Iliad, the Odyssey, where our hero in that story, Odysseus, is delayed in his journey home from the Trojan War, where he is held hostage and compelled to sleep with several goddesses, including the seven years he was forced to be the lover of the goddess Calypso. Now you might ask, did all the armies in the ancient world capture slaves and concubines? The answer is yes. In the ancient world, when a city-state suffered abject defeat in a bitter war, the women and the children were sold into slavery. The men were either slain or they were sentenced to death by working in the mines or other brutal of tasks. We read in the Iliad how Hector laments how his wife Adromache will be sold into slavery when he fears that Troy will eventually be defeated by the Achaeans. Hector fearfully tells his wife and queen there is nothing, nothing beside your agony when some brazen Argive hails you off in tears wrenching away your day of light and freedom. Then far away in the land of Argos you must live, laboring at a loom or at another's woman, beck and call. Actually in the myth, after the fall of Troy, the Dramache is forced to be a captive, to be a slave, but she's forced to be a concubine rather than working at the loom, but a concubine of a prince, which meant that she got to be queen, and soon the prince died and she was queen on her own, 
So things came out better and I guess that was good for the myth. When the Roman Empire was expanding in the centuries around the time of Christ, the Romans would enslave slaves by the hundreds and thousands and sometimes tens of thousands. And since these slaves were property, often the slave auctions displayed the slaves naked so the buyers knew what they were buying. Many buyers would purchase the female slaves to be their concubines. This was the case in nearly all slave societies, including the Deep South before the Civil War. No other source of slaves were those who were kidnapped and sold by pirates. One of the first adventures of the Odyssey pictures the Greeks acting as pirates on the, their way home to Ithaca. Uh, today, coastal property sells at a high premium. Everybody wants to live close to the beach, but not so much in the ancient world. Everybody in the ancient world wanted to live inland because pirates raided the coastal towns for booty and beauties. One overlooked provocation that prompted the knights to invade the Middle East during the Crusades is the Moorish slave traders who captured women and children along the Italian and Mediterranean coasts, even near the walls of Rome. Here in this painting, the Arab purchaser is determining whether or not this potential concubine has good teeth, as if she's like a horse. In our video on the Greek Cynic philosophers, we have an account how the Greek Cynic philosopher Diogenes of Sinope was captured by pirates when he was traveling and sold into slavery in Corinth. Pirates also sold any women slaves they caught as concubines, no less. Now the laws in the Torah and the Old Testament try to guarantee humane treatment of concubines that were captured in war by the ancient armies of Judah and Israel. And we read in Deuteronomy and for the mitzvah for concubines captured in war. And the Lord says, when you go forth to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God gives them into your hands, and you take them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you have a desire for her, and would take her for yourself as wife, then you shall bring her home to your house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails, and she shall put off her captive's garb, and shall remain in your house, and bewail her father and mother for a full month. After that, and only after that, may you go into her and be your husband, and she shall be your wife. Then, if you have no delight in her, you shall let her go where she will, but you shall not sell her for money. You shall not treat her as a slave, since you have humiliated her. The rabbis consider these verses important, for Maimonides, also known as Rambam, draws out several mitzvah from these verses. The gist of the rabbinical commentary is that the beautiful captive women should be treated with respect and dignity. They should not be treated as mere slaves. They should be treated as a wife like any other Jewish wife. She used to be left alone and not violated, allowed to mourn her loss for a solid month, to give time for the soldier's lust to subside. Maimonides regards this verse as only a concession to human weakness and that there is no doubt that one of the basest things a man can do is to discard a woman with whom he has lived together. Particularly when alone, she has no good way to earn a living for her and her children. Interestingly, the church father Origen, in his comments on these verses in the Torah, likens the beautiful captive women to the truths of pagan philosophy. When we read anything said by the Greek philosophers that is wise and knowledgeable, we should must cleanse it removing all that is dead and worthless. That is like when you trim the hair and clip the nails of the women taken from the spoils of the enemy, also known as the pagan philosophers. Only then will you take her as wife. There is an allegorical interpretation, as we discussed in our videos on St. Augustine Keystone work on Christian teaching, whenever the literal meaning of verses of scripture seems to contradict our twofold love of God and our love for our neighbor, then we must search for a deeper allegorical spiritual meaning for the problematic spiritual verse. The issues we confront with concubines also come up in the polygamous marriages uh, among the patriarchs of the Old Testament. And you might ask, why does the Bible discuss stories about polygamous marriages? Well, the story is, is that this was before the time of the law, and in these ancient times, polygamous marriages were acceptable and they were always more problematic than monogamous marriages. In many of these stories, a wife may offer her husband her handmaiden if she has difficulty becoming pregnant, which is also another type of concubine to ensure that the bloodline will not die out. This is true of the painting in our thumbnail where Abraham is turning out his handmaiden, Hagar, along with his son by her, Ishmael. 
when Sarah was barren despite the promise of Jehovah to provide descendants as numerous as the sands of the sea. Sarah gave her handmaiden Hagar to her husband Abraham to start his bloodline. Afterwards, after Sarah did give birth to Isaac, she became jealous of Hagar and persuaded Abraham and Jehovah to drive them out. We see Ishmael in this painting carrying some possessions hung from a pole while his brother Isaac is restrained by his brother Sarah so he can't follow them. God permits Sarah this deed because God will provide for Hagar and Ishmael. And we might point out this is one of those rare stories in the Old Testament where God lets a woman boss him around. We read in the Old Testament that Jacob has 12 sons from whom descend the 12 tribes of Israel. He bears these two sons not only from his two wives, Leah and Rachel, but also their two handmaidens. There are also accounts of the mass kidnapping of young girls as concubines of both the founding myths of Rome and the book of Judges. An early myth is that the male soldiers who were the founders of Rome needed wives to start the Roman bloodlines. So the founders of Rome kidnapped the women of a nearby tribe so they could marry them, as you can see in this painting of the rape of the Sabine women. Another ugly example is probably the worst incident in the book of Judges near the end, where the men of the tribe of Benjamin are permitted by the other tribes of Israel to seize the daughters of Shiloh as concubines and future wives. The overriding theme in the book of Judges is the theme that is frequently repeated in the last half of the book. Everyone in Israel did what was right in his own eyes, in place of the universal moral precept that we must love our neighbor as ourselves, relying on our own moral rationalizations rather than the golden rule laid out in the scriptures can cause us many sufferings and tragedy in our life, much like the many ugly stories we find in the book of Judges. Now the custom that kidnapping was an acceptable form of courtship never really died out until the time of Trent. This practice was condemned in several ancient and medieval church councils. Finally, among its other reforms regarding the sacrament of marriage, the Council of Trent repeated this condemnation, stating that kidnapping is not an acceptable method of courtship, which we covered in another video. We read in the Confessions of St. Augustine before he was baptized as a Christian that he lived with a concubine for 15 years who bore him a son, the Deodatus, which means a gift from God. He was not permitted to marry her under Roman law since she was born into a lower class. But his mother Monica convinces him to put her away to marry a wealthy Christian girl who was too young at the moment, but she would grow up pretty soon. But later he regrets this and never marries her. And we read about his regret in his confessions. Well into the Middle Ages, the church tolerated men taking concubines, as did St. Augustine in his youth. When the barbarians started raiding Roman cities, St. Augustine, as Bishop of Hippo, had to confront the pastoral problem of whether the women who were raped by the ravaging barbarians had lost their virginity, making them unsuitable for marriage. In the life of St. Augustine, he is quoted as saying, Chastity is not destroyed in the body when the will of the sufferer does not shamefully take part in the deeds of the flesh, but without consenting endures another's violence. What moral lessons can we draw from this ugly history of concubines? And we can be thankful for a modern world where all men and women can look forward to peaceful years of retirement after they have worked all their lives. And we can give thanks for prisons, policemen, forensic science, and DNA testing which holds men accountable, none of which existed in the ancient world. When we study Greco-Roman history and philosophy and Old Testament stories, we should interpret the ugly stories either allegorically or in the context of ancient history, which describes a bygone world in which women were just not safe when their warrior husbands and fathers were not nearby. We can note that these works, and the Old Testament in particular, tried to blunt the brutality of many cruelties common in the ancient world to treat everyone, including women and slaves, with the dignity and respect that all mankind who was created in the image of God deserve to be treated. One lesson women should always resist, and I say this from my experience as a facilitator for divorce support groups, this ugly history should never teach us that women need to tolerate physical or sexual abuse under any circumstances, that if they are in a relationship in which they do not feel safe, they must always flee to a place where they feel safe. 
God m may hate divorce, but he hates physical abuse worse than divorce. Although women today should refuse to live under the difficult circumstances that women in the ancient world were forced to tolerate, we can learn the general lesson that when we are forced to live and work under difficult circumstances, we can always make the best of our situation and be in as compassionate and kind as possible. No matter what our circumstances, we can always choose to live a godly life. Now we'll talk about the sources used for our video. Of course, we have the Iliad. You may not wish to read the Iliad straight through like a novel. Maybe you want to listen to Miss Van Diver's lectures first. I find the Iliad a joy to read. And we also have the Odyssey by Homer, and it tells of some scenes in the Trojan War that are not included in the Iliad. And of course, we have the Old Testament as a great source. And we also have the lectures of Miss Van Diver, the Iliad of Homer, on the Great Courses, not the Great Courses Plus. The same is true for David Schenker. He's on the Great Courses, but not the Great Courses Plus. He has six lectures on Homer, and these lectures are excellent also. Also, I'd like to point out another Jewish website, Shabbat.org. It has the Old Testament in English and in Hebrew, and also includes the commentary of Rashi, another medieval commentary that's excellent. Please click on the links below for our blogs on the Iliad and the Odyssey. Please click on the links for our YouTube videos on the Iliad and the Stoic Philosophers and other interesting videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.